This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 32, for broadcast on the 13th of March, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's Juno spacecraft measures oxygen production on the ice moon Europa. A new phenomenon challenging textbook definitions of white dwarf stars and Japan's lunar lander put to sleep after surviving the freezing lunar night. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Juno spacecraft has directly measured charged oxygen and hydrogen molecules from the atmosphere of Jupiter's ice moon Europa. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, will provide scientists with key constraints on the potential habitability of the distant world's global subsurface ocean. Juno's principal investigator Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute says the study provides the first direct in situ measurements of the water components existing in Europa's atmosphere, giving scientists a narrow range that could support habitability. Back in 2022, Juno completed a flyby of Europa, coming to within 352 kilometres of the Jovian moon's frozen surface. Juno detected significant amounts of charged molecular hydrogen and oxygen being lost from the Moon's atmosphere. It's the first time scientists have been able to definitively detect hydrogen and oxygen with in situ measurements and so further confirm that Europa's atmosphere is made primarily of hydrogen and oxygen molecules. Now, the source of these molecules is thought to be water ice on Europa's surface. Jupiter's rampant radiation breaks down H2O's molecular bonds, leaving behind oxygen and hydrogen. The heavier oxygen molecules remain more concentrated down on the surface or near-surface atmosphere, while the lighter hydrogen molecules escape into space. The oxygen produced in the ice is either eventually lost from the atmosphere or it's sequestered back into the surface. Now, oxygen retained in Europa's crustal ice may work its way down into the Moon's subsurface ocean. There, it could become a possible metabolic energy source. Europa's icy crust absorbs radiation, thereby protecting the liquid water ocean underneath. This absorption also produces oxygen within the ice. So, in a way, the ice shell acts as Europa's lungs, providing a potential oxygen source for the ocean. The study's authors placed narrow constraints on the total oxygen production at Europa at around 12 kilograms per second. Now, before Juno, previous estimates ranged from as few as just 1 or 2 kilograms per second to over 1,000 kilograms a second. The study's new estimation of how much oxygen is produced within Europa's surface could inform future research related to its subsurface ocean and the potential there for life. After all, here on planet Earth, wherever scientists find water, they also find life. This is space time. Still to come, a new phenomenon challenging textbook definitions of white dwarf stars and new clues about the evolution of the planet Neptune. All that and more still to come on space time. Astronomers have discovered a population of white dwarf stars that have mysteriously stopped cooling. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature, challenges ideas on how old stars really are and what happens to them when they die. White dwarfs are the collapsed cause of sun-like stars. Stars shine by fusing hydrogen into helium in their core. When they run out of core hydrogen, they contract, eventually increasing core temperatures and pressures until they can begin fusing core helium into carbon and oxygen. At the same time, a shell of hydrogen begins burning outside the core. Now, all this causes the star's outer gaseous envelope to expand. And as it's now much further away from the contracted core, it also cools down, turning the star into a red giant. Now, eventually, the star will run out of core helium to fuse. And as these stars aren't massive enough to fuse heavier elements, the star dies. Its now bloated outer envelope floats away as a spectacular cloud called a planetary nebula. That leaves its white-hot stellar core exposed 
as a white dwarf. These exposed stellar cores then slowly cool over the eons. Astronomers think about 97% of all stars, including our own star, the Sun, will eventually become white dwarfs. However, in 2019, data from the European Space Agency's Gaia satellite discovered a population of white dwarf stars that have quite literally stopped cooling for more than 8 billion years. Now, this suggests that some white dwarfs can generate significant extra energy, which is at odds with the classical dead star picture. And astronomers were initially unsure exactly how this could happen. Scientists have long considered that white dwarfs stop producing heat and cool down until the dense plasma in their interiors eventually freezes into a solid state and the star solidifies from the inside out. It's a cooling process which would take billions of years. However, according to the new research, in some white dwarfs the dense plasma in the interior doesn't simply freeze from the inside out. Instead, solid crystals that are formed upon freezing are less dense than the liquid, and therefore they want to float. Now, as the crystals float upwards, they displace heavier liquids downwards. The transport of heavier material towards the centre of the star releases gravitational energy, and it's this energy which is enough to interrupt the star's cooling process, possibly for billions of years. One of the study's authors, Antoine Bedard from the University of Warwick, says this explanation matches all the observed properties which have been seen in this unusual white dwarf population. The authors hypothesize that this happens in some white dwarfs but not others because of differences in the composition of the star. The study's co-author, Simon Bluen from the University of Victoria, says that some white dwarf stars are formed by the merger of two different stars. When these stars collide to form a white dwarf, it changes the composition of the star in a way that allows for the formation of floating crystals. This new discovery will not only require astronomy textbooks to be revised, but also for astronomers to revisit the process they use to determine the age of stellar populations. Currently, white dwarfs are routinely used as age indicators. The cooler the white dwarf star is, the older it's assumed to be. However, due to the extra delay in cooling found in some white dwarfs, some stars of a given temperature could be billions of years older than previously thought. And this complicates age dating and the use of white dwarfs to reconstruct the formation history of our Milky Way galaxy. This is Space Time. Still to come, new clues about the formation of the planet Neptune and Japan's moon lander put to sleep after surviving the freezing lunar night. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, Incogni. And today we've got something really special for all of you who are tired of those never-ending robo-calls, not to mention spam emails and SMSs. Have you ever wondered why this trash keeps coming? Well, the culprits are data brokers, people living on the dark web who are snooping out all your personal information. Not only do they have your phone numbers and email and street addresses, they'll get everything they can on you in order to build up a complete profile. Not just of you, but your whole family. And they'll then sell that to anyone willing to pay. But there is a way to fight back, and it's called Incogni. Incogni's on a mission to stop these nuisances by directly targeting the source, the data brokers. By securing your personal information, Incogni ensures your data doesn't end up on those lists, giving you peace of mind. And the best part is, right now as a space-time listener, you get an exclusive 60% off the annual Incogni plan. So just head over to incogni.com slash Stuart Gary and use our special code Stuart Gary, all one word at the checkout. And of course, if you're not completely satisfied, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So there are no risks, just privacy. So don't let your phone and email become a target for unwanted calls and spam. Take control with Incogni. Just visit incogni.com slash Stuart Gary and don't forget the code Stuart Gary at the checkout for your special discount. After all, isn't it time that we all enjoyed a little bit more peace and quiet? Just go to incogni.com slash Stuart Gary. And of course, we'll have all the details in the show notes and on the Space Time website. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. 
A ring of icy rocks orbiting the sun just beyond Neptune may give astronomers a glimpse of how Neptune and other objects in the outskirts of the solar system were formed. The key is the binary asteroid system more somnus, a tiny pair of frozen worlds bound together by gravity and which originate from within the Kuiper belt. Studying these icy asteroids can serve as a basis for understanding the dynamical history of Neptune and a family of celestial bodies known as trans-Neptunian objects. Together, this binary asteroid system and other nearby trans-Neptunian objects in the same dynamical group can act as an indicator to potentially track Neptune's migration before it settles into its current orbit. Binaries separated by distances, more sumnuses, rarely survive outside areas bounded by gravity and sheltered by other flecks of ice and rock, such as the Kuiper Belt. To survive implantation in such areas, they require a slow transportation process towards their current orbital positions. It's thought that the outwards migration of the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn 4.5 billion years ago triggered a series of gravitational perturbations among the ice giants Neptune and Uranus, forcing them further out and away from the Sun. Now, the current hypothesis also suggests that these dynamical forces cause Neptune and Uranus to swap orbital positions and at the same time fling a possible third ice giant that might have formed in the system out of the solar system completely to now wander alone through interstellar space as a rogue planet. The findings, reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, also used the Webb Space Telescope to study the surface compositions of the Moore's somnus binary pair. The study's authors, Anna Carolina de Souza Feliciano and Naomi Finela Alonso from the University of Central Florida, undertook the work as part of research for the Discovering the Surface Compositions of Trans-Neptunian Objects program, better known as Discotinos. Discotinos is part of the first cycle of the James Webb Space Telescope's observation program, focusing on the analysis of the solar system and the unique spectral properties of small celestial bodies beyond Neptune within the Kuiper Belt. So far, studies of more than 60 trans-Neptunian objects have already been carried out under the program. But what's unique to this work is that it was possible to study the surface composition of the two components of the more sunless binary pair, something that had never been done before and which could have implications for how scientists understand the region beyond Neptune. The authors use the Webb Space Telescope's wide spectral capabilities to analyse the elemental compositions of half a dozen suspected closely related trans-Neptunian object surfaces in order to confirm that Moore's somnus has much in common with its neighbouring trans-Neptunian objects. These largely undisturbed bodies are designated as cold classical, and they serve as points of reference where Neptune didn't disturb them during its migration. Due to the similar spectroscopic behaviour of Moore's and Sumnus, and their similarities with the cold classical group, the authors found compositional evidence for the formation of the binary pair beyond 30 astronomical units. That's beyond the orbit of Neptune. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Vanilla Alonso says she's studying how the actual chemistry and physics of these trans-Neptunian objects reflect the distribution of molecules based on carbon, oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen in the Sun's protoplanetary disk that gave birth to the planets, their moons and other small bodies. Of course, these same molecules were also the origins of life and water here on Earth. So I am focused on the space composition of minor bodies of the solar system. So minor bodies of the solar system, comets, asteroids, uh, meteorites, everything about that I am interested on it. To conduct our research, we are astronomers, so we need telescopes. So this DISCO is the acronym for discovering the surface composition of transatlantic objects. This project is an observational program uh, conducted on the James Webb Space Telescope and we were awarded with almost 100 hours on the first cycle, like they, they launched the telescope, they made the first call for proposals and we were awarded with almost 100 hours to study these, minor, these icy minor bodies of the solar system. And our goal is to study the surface composition of these targets, 60 objects, that are orbiting beyond the orbit of Neptune. So they contain a lot of ices, but we have not been able to see them before with the instrumentation uh, located ground-based. 
So now with the James Webb, it's a unique opportunity to really dig up information on what is the recipe to, to have to build a transmitting analogy. Well, there are two things that excite me a lot. The first is what I mentioned before, that um, we are seeing the solar system as we never saw it before. It's like uh, when you lead a mission and you approach an object. Before we approached Pluto, we had just some pixels on the screen and we knew there were different materials because they had different color and different albedo. But we were not ready, at least I was not ready for the amazing mountains, valleys, uh, glaciers, caps, everything that the images reveal. And that is in a similar way is happening now for us with James Webb and will be happening for, for decades, I think, because we were not able before to access this kind of information with the instrumentation that we have. So the other amazing thing is that we don't know where we are going to it. And that is not as much as the, the senior career that are going to do that. It's all the young people, the next generations that are being trained now with working with, the, with us and the different groups, the ones that are really going to, to explore the deep and breadth of, uh, of the JSWST data. That's Anna Carolina de Souza Feliciano and Naomi Felina Alonso from the University of Central Florida. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Japan's lunar lander put to sleep after surviving the long, freezing lunar night. And later in the science report, the Great Barrier Reef suffering another coral bleaching event. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Mission managers at JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, have placed their lunar lander back into sleep mode after it surprisingly survived the freezing cold lunar night. The smart lander for investigating the moon, or SLIM, touched down on the lunar surface in January, coming to rest on its side after one of its propulsion rockets failed. This left the spacecraft with its solar panels facing the wrong way. They needed to recharge the spacecraft's batteries and power the spaceship. But as the sun angle shifted, SLIM came back to life for a brief two days, carrying out scientific observations of a crater with its high-spec camera. The thing is, the probe was never designed to survive the harsh 15 Earth Day lunar night, where temperatures can plummet to minus 133 degrees Celsius. So, mission managers were surprised when the probe phoned home. They grabbed as much data as they could before the spacecraft went back to sleep as the sun set. They say they'll attempt to revive the probe again in a fortnight's time when the next lunar day dawns. That'll be late March. But they admit the likelihood of failure will increase due to the severe temperature cycles. The mission was originally designed to examine a part of the moon's mantle that lay beneath the crust, which is believed to be accessible at the landing site. And the spacecraft has been sending back scientific data during its waking hours. This is also the first time Japan has successfully landed a spacecraft on the moon, making Japan only the fifth nation to achieve a soft lunar landing after the United States, the Soviet Union, China and India. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Scientists say a mass bleaching event is currently unfolding on the Great Barrier Reef. The event, the seventh since 1998, was confirmed following aerial surveys of 300 shallow reefs. Coral bleaching occurs when underwater temperatures are more than a degree warmer than the long-term average. This causes corals to come under heat stress. That forces them to expel algae living within their tissues, draining them of their vibrant colours and causing them to starve. This latest bleaching event is unfolding in an area where corals have not previously been exposed to extreme temperatures. 
Often called the world's largest living structure, the Great Barrier Reef is a 2,300 kilometre long expanse of tropical corals along the Queensland Pacific coast, housing a stunning array of biodiversity. A new study shows that smoking rates are down, vaping is up and one in five Australians are using illegal drugs. The findings are included in the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's latest survey. The National Drug Strategy Household Survey outlines the attitudes and usage of tobacco, e-cigarettes and vaping, as well as alcohol and illicit drugs for more than 21,000 people across Australia. The survey found that the rates of smoking have dropped by two-thirds since 1991, while at the same time e-cigarette and vaping rates are up from 2.5% in 2019 to 7% today. The report also shows that three in four Australians drank alcohol in the past 12 months, with close to one in three consuming it in ways that put their health at risk. Additionally, one in five Australians aged 14 or older have been using illegal drugs, with close to half of Australians reporting having used illicit drugs at least once in their lifetimes. A wide survey of posts on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, suggests that global happiness levels take about two weeks to rebound following a global crisis of shock. Two events, the initiation of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, were studied by surveying discourse on Twitter in the weeks before and after the events. The findings reported in the journal PLOS One suggest that while people were more immediately upset by a lockdown, it only took two weeks for them to rebound. On the other hand, the Russian invasion of Ukraine caused less of a downturn in happiness, but it's taking longer for the mood to improve. Apple have just released their latest iOS updates for iPhone and iPads. With the details of what's in 17.4, we're joined by technology editor Alex Zahara Wright from Tech Advice Start Life. I've launched both 17.4 for iOS for the phones and for iPads. Two big things. One is that if you're now listening to Apple Podcasts, whether you're listening to shows or you're watching shows, 17.4 now gives you a live transcription of what's being said using, of course, AI. And the transcription seems to be extremely accurate. So if you'd like to sort of read along or you'd like to get a uh, printed version of what it is that's been said, it's there. Now there's things like new emojis and there's no uh, bug fixes. Another thing with the iPhone version is that the stolen device protection we spoke about previously can now be said to be activated everywhere, even in locations such as home and work or the pub that you frequent on a regular basis, which in theory would have been marked as a safe location. So if somebody sort of stole your phone from one of those places, you wouldn't have had the protections that were offered. So now you can manually toggle that on. So uh, those are the two sort of big things with iPhones and iPads. And the other big thing that was launched is new Macs. Now, there was a rumor that we'd have new iPads as well, and presumably that will happen sometime this month. But the new MacBook Air, the one with the 13.6-inch screen, and the new MacBook Air with the 15-inch screen now has the M3 chip. So Apple has launched the M1 chip in 2020, and they're saying this M3 version is 40 to 60% faster on, on most metrics, which is a pretty good speed bump. Now, if you have the M2, well, the improvement's only about 20%, and so, you know, there's no great need for you to update if you bought one of the models last year. But if you've been holding out from an old Intel-powered version, well, you get much, much faster speed. There's no fan inside generating noise, and instead of about six hours of battery life, you have about 18. Uh, but for the first time, we've seen Apple really promoting the fact that these new Macs are great for AI. And in fact, every Mac, they say, is great for AI. They've had a, a neural engine inside the uh, iPhones and iPads and Macs for, for some time, at least with the versions powered by the M series processor. And Apple is going to have a huge push this year with the Worldwide Developer Conference to have like a Siri version of ChatGPT. And they've spent like a billion dollars over the past 12 months to, to make this happen. And this is the first time that Apple has really mentioned the word AI. They've let everybody else mention the words AI, but they themselves have spoken about machine learning and they speak about how you can use the machine learning to figure out all the different photos and have them show which ones are you, your friends, your partner, your pets, you know, all these different you know, the things that have been happening in the background without actually giving you the generative AI that we're used to from Google Gemini, from perplexity.ai, from ChatGPT, from Microsoft Copilot. So Apple's prepping us for this big push in AI. And, and you know, Apple normally when it does something, it does it right. It does it in a way that everybody else wants to copy it. Now, it's been very late on AI and Apple's prepping us for this. Uh, hopefully, a lot of these AI functions will work on older iPhones. Obviously, the iPhone 16 coming later this year uh, it will be the one that will really 
push for it. But, you know, there's no reason why iPhone 15 Pro Max from last year, barely six months old, shouldn't be able to do all the same AI stuff as well. So looking forward to seeing that. And uh, that's probably the biggest news of the week thus far. That's Alex Sahara of Reut from Tech Advice. Start live. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 